It was a lover and his lass With a hay and a hoe and a hay And now you know that over the green cornfield did pass One of the things that we found is that music activates every region of the brain. 20 years ago, we thought that music was predominantly lateralized, that is, exclusive to the right hemisphere. That turns out to be overly simplistic. What we know now is that music activates both sides of the brain and the front and the back, the top and the bottom, the outside and the inside. In fact, music activates every region of the brain that we've so far mapped, perhaps more so than almost any other human activity. Sweet lovers, love of the spring. Music, perhaps the most sublime gift of our sense of hearing. Making music has released our creativity and given us one of our strongest reasons to believe in the nobility of our species. But why, alone among the species of the earth, are we the one that hears and makes music? Answering that question takes us on a journey to the essence of the sense of hearing, a journey through the ear, into the brain, and right to the heart of the human psyche. Hearing is a product of evolution, developed to help us survive in a scary and often hostile world. It's the second of our senses to emerge in the womb after touch, and it connects us in a profound and intimate way to the body that bears us. The hearing we develop in the womb is the sense of a supremely successful hunter. In the fastness of the primeval forest, eyes were of limited utility. Hearing helped us find prey hidden in dense foliage. It warned us of predators before we could see them. Hearing orients us in the world and informs us about events behind us, around corners, or beyond upcoming obstacles. The hunter-gatherers we all descend from survived by listening carefully to the world around them. Today, we are more likely to try to shut that world out. Since we can't close our ears as we can our eyes, we shut out the noise by creating our own audio environment, most often with the type of sound humans seem to find most pleasing, music. Recording most of the music we listen to requires an environment that is perhaps the most rare, difficult, and expensive to achieve in our urban cacophonous world. Total silence. Dr. Daniel Levitin's regular job is neuropsychology. Teacher and researcher at McGill University, his specialty is music and the brain, an interest he picked up during a former career as a rock musician. I played in a succession of rock bands that kept breaking up for all the typical reasons, uh, drug abuse and fights over arrangements and fights over the women that were around. And, 
eventually, uh, when one band broke up, I decided that having spent all these years clawing my way up to the bottom of the music business, I didn't want to do that again. And so I went into production. I started working in the studio to record other artists. He would work with such legends as Stevie Wonder and the Grateful Dead before turning to psychology. Today, he's producing another musical <laughs> academic, physicist Diane Nalini, who is recording songs with lyrics by that legend of Tin Pan Alley, William Shakespeare. You don't have to study psychology to love music, but eventually, if you're a scientist, you'll find yourself asking, why do I love music? It was a lover and his lass with a hey and a ho and a hey, none you know that. And of course, of all the arts, music is the most mysterious. Um, it's, uh, it can affect one profoundly, and yet it is not representative. It, doesn't, it is not symbolic in the way of language. It doesn't depict like painting. One can't say in a way what music is about uh, unless it is states of mind and states of the heart. Sweet lovers love of the spring. What happens to sound, and particularly music, after it becomes neural impulses is a vast mystery whose scale and complexity are only now being comprehended. But what we have discovered without any doubt is that hearing, in all its wonderful manifestations, is all about the brain. Deafness, on the other hand, is all about the ear and the electromechanical process that gets the noise of the world into our heads. There's uh, an ear canal that goes down to an eardrum, and sound waves come and pressure variations in the atmosphere come down to the eardrum and it vibrates. The idea is that the air pressure is the same on both sides of the eardrum. And so if the eardrum vibrates, it can transmit these vibrations through three tiny bones from the eardrum into the inner ear of the cochlea. And then it's transformed from vibrations in air to vibrations in a fluid, and that tiny movement in the fluid is picked up by hair cells which sense changes in pressure and turn them into neural energy and that's transmitted to the brain. And the brain, the brain then can, can decipher all these tiny little movements and, and, and turn it into sound that we perceive. Dr. Papson's patient today is 11-month-old Hayden, who, like about 100 babies a year in Ontario, was born deaf due to malfunction of the cochlea or inner ear. Papson and his team at Toronto's Sick Children's Hospital will restore some of that function using a tiny, ingenious little device called a cochlear implant. The cochlear implant is an amazing thing. I have a demo of one. And basically, it's this tiny little computer with microphones along the back. And this is worn behind the ear with the microphone sort of directed at the speaker and the world around you. And then this processor takes analog sound and digitizes it and sends it up into this little coil. Now this coil is actually uh, an FM transmitter that has a very, very small broadcast range. In fact, only a very few millimeters. And so inside the skin is this other couple and see they'll couple together with a magnet. So I implant this part and this part is magnetically coupled so that it's within its broadcast range. The power is on the outside, the battery's on the outside. And this drives this little computer and this has two separate little uh, electrodes. One is the size and shape of a human cochlea that's fully inserted into the cochlea and that has 22 specific discrete stimulating uh, electrodes and this goes in to stimulate the cochlea at different sites and that's how the cochlear implant works. A healthy cochlea is lined with about 3,000 tiny hairs, each one positioned to respond to a particular frequency by firing a small charge into the auditory nerve relaying the frequency to the auditory cortex in the brain. When the hair cells can't do their job, the implant replaces these 3,000 hairs with just 12 to 22 electrodes, less than 1% of the normal complement. What we found is that if you just get almost anything into the cochlea, eight, nine channels of information, 
the brain can figure the rest out. That's the fascinating piece about cochlear implantation is how good the brain is at picking up this primitive information and turning it into a linguistic code and into a, uh, uh, a musical representation of the world. It allows us to take this primitive input and turn it into the things that are most important for humans to perceive. Taking very restricted information from the ear and using it to create the illusion of a complete world of sound turns out to be the secret of understanding how we all hear. Though virtually everyone has felt the power of music, no one has yet satisfactorily explained its near mystical ability to shape the way we see and feel our world. Music affects us in different ways. Sometimes it soothes us, sometimes it rouses us, sometimes in a church it will go with a, an attitude of, of reverence, uh, in a dance hall it may go with, with, with sort of uh, with, with excitement and frenzy. Um, the whole um, keyboard of emotions, uh, including, I think, emotions to which we can't give any name. Science has been looking into music's power for only a few decades, and much remains mysterious. There's still disagreement over whether music evolved from speech or on some separate path. But no one denies that music of a sort is inseparable from spoken language. Human speech is a sound source with a rich set of resonances, of harmonics. There aren't all that many continuous sounds that we're exposed to that have that harmonic structure. And one speculation is that our ear gets attuned to harmonic relations in music because it's, we spend so much time analyzing the harmonic structure of speech. In other words, you can sense what somebody's saying even without the words if they go wah, 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 wah. That's a question, or rah, 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 right? That's some sort of angry exclamation. So there's this common pitch trajectory, we call it prosody in the linguistics community, that is imparting something about the content of the speech without there being actual semantics. But whatever its uses or even roots in speech, music has without doubt taken on a life of its own. It turns out this is reflected in the brain structure. We've been interested in understanding similarities and differences between music and spoken language. To what extent do similar brain regions process the two, and what can that tell us about evolution and about the, the structure of the brain? So what we found in a recent study is that there are areas of overlap as well as areas of distinctiveness. That is, there are some parts of the brain that do process both speech and music, but other parts that process one and not the other. As you see here, the red regions are regions that are exclusively music. The blue regions are regions that are exclusively speech. There's also a little bit of music here behind the speech that we're not seeing. separate processing areas for speech and music turns out to have some radical implications. What if your speech centers work, but your music centers aren't there? If you can't even imagine what that might mean, you should meet Dolores. A retired school teacher from the Bronx, Dolores is intelligent, articulate, with a full range of normal human hearing. In her 35 years working in the New York school system, Dolores probably listened to her national anthem, if not every day, certainly several times a week. It's safe to say that the Star Spangled Banner is the most familiar piece of music in Dolores's life. I, I know I've heard that before, but I, I don't remember, I don't know what, I, I know I heard it before. Um, but I don't know, I really don't know what it is, but it, 
The reason I know I heard it before is because now that I'm listening for rhythm, it seems to have a, a definite rhythm to it. Uh, but I don't know what it is. This inability to recognize music, even the most familiar, has been with Dolores all her life. Though she knew she was different, she had no idea how or why. She was in her 60s before she even knew there was a name for her condition, amusia. In the late 90s, I saw an article in the New York Times written by Dr. Isabella Peretz, and it described a condition that she called amusia. So I read the article several times, and I said to my husband, this is what I have. I know this is what I have, and I'm going to write a letter. Uh, Dolores is a, a case of congenital amusia. That is, as far as she can remember, she always uh, avoided music. Uh, in her case, she really has a problem even to stand music. I hear noise. If a car horn is honking, that could be music. Uh, if dishes crash to the floor, that's what I hear is music, if there's traffic. So I don't really know what I'm hearing, but I know I'm not hearing what other people are hearing. The sense of music is so fundamental to normal human hearing that it's very difficult for most of us to imagine Dolores' experience, unless, like Oliver Sacks, you've been there. Well, I, um, I did find it impossible to imagine until 1974, when strangely, I had two brief attacks myself, both associated with a migraine. And once I was driving along Bronx River Parkway with a radio on, it was playing a Chopin ballade I was very fond of, and then it started to change. It, uh, the, um, the piano took on a very unpleasant banging, reverberatory quality, and it seemed to lose its tonality. And finally, all I heard was a, a toneless banging on a sheet of metal. Toneless banging is Dolores' constant companion. In a world where music is everywhere, from the supermarket aisle to every movie and television show, even to her yoga relaxation class, Dolores' condition is not just a deficit, it's an affliction. I went to see the musical Cats. Not that I wanted to see it, but uh, we got tickets from someone who couldn't use them. And by the end of the first act, I didn't feel that great. By the end of the second act, when the show was over, I went outside, I sat down on the curb, and I said, I'm so nauseous, I don't know if I'm going to throw up. I have such a headache. I will never, ever again sit through something like that. And I never have. Hello, Dad. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Good, it's nice to see you. Standing in stark contrast to Dolores is Lisa Walsh. Lisa has a condition called Williams Syndrome, the result of a genetic anomaly on chromosome 7. Why don't you stand here in front of the microphone? Williams Syndrome is a neurodevelopmental disorder affecting 1 in 20,000 births. It results in dramatic cognitive impairments. People with Williams syndrome can't count or tell time. They usually don't learn to read. And yet, their music and their language are relatively preserved. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that said a wretch like me. Lisa Walsh is somebody who has difficulty reading and telling time and uh, reasoning. She doesn't have any sense of time or of number, uh, but she has great musical time. When she sings, she can sing right on the beat. She can play around with the beat the way Sinatra or Ella Fitzgerald would. Uh, you know, singing intentionally off the accompaniment in order to create dramatic effect. And 
you can see that she's completely enveloped by and engrossed in the music. She's very musical. What we've learned about the Williams brain is that it appears to be wired up differently than normal brains. Uh, they seem to be using more of their brain to listen to music, and indeed all sounds, than average people do. More of their brain is invested in sound for reasons that we don't fully understand. At one extreme, a woman leading a perfectly normal life despite having no conception of music. At the other, a gifted musician who struggles with almost everything else. The hour I first believed. The clear message is that hearing, at least musical hearing, is a system unto itself, independent of the other cognitive functions of our brain. So just what is this system, and why is it there? When we hear music or sound of any kind, it sets off a very complicated chain of events. It seems that you just open your ears like the way you open your eyes and the impression of the auditory world is just there. But it's actually many different stages that occur very rapidly. After the um, sound leaves the eardrums, it's no longer sound, it's electrical impulses. And at that point, a bunch of different special purpose analysis units in the brain get involved. Part of the brain analyzes the pitch of what you're hearing, another part the loudness, another part is analyzing the rhythm, the temporal pattern. It all comes together at higher cortical centers where we're given the perception of a violin note or a piano chord, but these aspects of the sound are put together separately. We know this because when damage occurs in the brain, it can take out one of these processing modules and you lose the ability to track the pitch of something, but you still know the rhythm and the loudness or vice versa. So at the Montreal Jazz Festival, when people like Dolores are probably hearing something like this, the rest of us are hearing sweet music. One more time. courtesy of what are effectively auditory illusions produced by our brains. But that still doesn't explain why we hear music. On one level, the answer to that question is relatively simple. There are regions that have been known for a long time to be involved when gamblers win a bet or drug addicts take their drug of choice or when you have sex. Uh, these centers modulate the release and uptake of dopamine, the so-called feel-good neurotransmitter, and they signal to your body that this is a pleasurable experience and that you're enjoying it. When we play people music that they like, the same region comes online. It's a network involving structures such as the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, and the hypothalamus. And it's not simply that people are telling us they like music, we're seeing the neural corroboration of it here. That would explain this, and the billions we spend on music every day. It's chocolate for the ears. But that just begs the question, why would evolution select for beings who can hear and love music? One suggestion, purporting to explain the sexual excesses of rock stars, goes back to the father of evolutionary theory himself. Charles Darwin felt that music was there uh, to signal sexual fitness uh, and that it played a big role in the evolution of our species. And you look at Mick Jagger, for example, somebody who's not conventionally good looking, but is regarded by many women as sexy, nevertheless. And he's had who knows how many sexual liaisons. Who can deny the role of music in the dance of love? But that doesn't explain its appeal to those too young or old for that dance. So other scientists suggest music may have emerged when early hominids discovered the power of working together. Community requires empathy, and music carries that in spades. 
music reveals to us the extent of our own emotionality. It's also a tremendous bonding thing. People sing together, people dance together, and they've probably done that since, since the species evolved. Um, rhythm in particular and music in general hold people together. As evidence, if we needed it, consider this. For the last 30 years at least, Montrealers have been gathering every summer Sunday at the foot of Mount Royal for the weekly Tam Tam session. Spontaneous drumming and dance for the simple delight of rhythm and movement. In most languages in the world, the word for music and the word for dance are the same word. They don't make a distinction because it's very unnatural to have one without the other. Urban sophistication giving joyous way to the atavistic pleasures that define us as a species. So fundamental is rhythm to musical hearing that it's likely it was the first music module to emerge. Today, it's so widely shared, so finely tuned, so evolved, that it even played a role in the scientific revolution. All one's movements are coordinated and synchronized and beautifully timed by music, very, very exactly timed. Something which always fascinates me is the description by Galileo of how when he wanted to time the descent of objects on, a, on an inclined plane, he did it by singing a theme or singing a song. Um, the chronometers of his time were not as accurate as that. Nowhere in the natural world do we find music, except as we hear it. As far as we know, no other species responds to it as we do. Music, apparently, is a product of our astonishing brain and very literally a gift of our sense of hearing. right there with Hayden. Angie, if you can sit right It's been here. four weeks we since Hayden received his there. cochlear implants. The incisions have healed, and today they'll be switched on. Definitely come in. You don't want to miss this. <laughs> it's gonna be After so a year of life in a silent world, here, Hayden is oh, about to hear his higher. mother's it's voice for the first deep, time. Deep. We're going to watch. So what I'm going to do, the first thing, is connect Hayden's cochlear implant to my computer so we don't need the batteries. And then I'm going to Audiologist check Laurie McDonald sure begins working. with okay. a direct electronic feed to determine the minimum volume Hayden can detect. So I'm just slowly getting louder. Maybe. Good. The process is repeated for each of Hayden's active Good. electrodes. Okay, so now I'm ready to turn it on. Right now, he's only heard sounds beeps from the computer, so when I turn it on, he's going to hear all of the sounds in the room, and Mom, you can be the first person to talk to him. And you know, he, he may be upset, he may be not upset at all, hardly phased by it at all, but whatever he does is fine, okay? Oops. One, two, three, go. Hayden. Hey, Hayden. It's okay. Startled by his mother's voice, Hayden is soon terrified by his own. But this is normal and will change very soon. Ah! 
The obvious question is, what exactly is Hayden hearing through those few electrodes in his cochlea? We have no way of knowing for sure, but we can get some idea from simulations and the experience of adult recipients. And so there are these simulations available, and we have one here, so I can play that for you. And what you'll see is that if we have um, frequencies that are important for speech and we divide those up into 16 little groupings, what you can hear is something that's going to sound very artificial, but you can sort of make it out. What you can hear is... They say some silly things. And this is actually... They say some silly things. Okay, so even though the resolution of that sound is not complete and full, you get the gist of it. Once again, the implants take the hundreds of frequencies present in speech, they say some silly things, and pass on just 8 to 22 of them. They say some silly things. But that still doesn't tell us what those electronic impulses actually sound like. Gina Sun also works with implant patients. She herself suffers from progressive deafness and has worn hearing Hello. aids for most of her life. Hello. Six months ago, she received an implant in her right Hello, ear. Hello, how are you? When I was first activated, I knew that it was going to sound very different because I had been working with these children for so many years and I had seen their reactions and most often the children cry and they get upset, so I knew it was going to sound very strange. When it, but it was still very different to me. Um, when they first turned it on, it sounded very much like R2-D2 from the Star Wars movie. From the Star Wars movies, a lot of beeps and buzzes and whistles. Um, everything, every time people talked, um, I was hearing <laughs> whistles like that. And um, even when I ran um, running water, it didn't sound like a shh, it sounded like whistles going off. And it sounded like that for about a couple of weeks. And eventually, you know, every day the whistling slowly started to disappear and the sound started to sound a bit more natural. And I would say probably by about a month, everything was sounding fairly, fairly natural and fairly, fairly like what I had remembered them to be sounding like before. Despite her disability, Gina plays piano and accompanies the choir at her church. Here, too, she experienced the phenomenon of familiar sounds being completely scrambled. I had avoided playing the piano for the first couple of weeks with my implant. Um, when I finally did sit down to play, it sounded completely different. It, uh, it didn't match up with my hand movements at all. It didn't um, sound anything like I was used to hearing the piano sound. Um, but I kept persisting with it. And after about, again, after about a few weeks, it started, to, it started to get a little bit better and it started to sound more natural. The signals being produced by her implant did not change. Gina's mind simply accommodated them, eventually assigning to them the sound she expected to hear. In effect, her brain produced some mental sleight of hand. This cerebral prestidigitation turns out to be a routine parlor trick employed by the brain every second we're awake. And in fact, holds the secret of how we make sense of the great noise of creation. Sound reaches our ears as waves, ripples in the ocean of air. But the world around us produces a tossed salad of sounds, each with its own specific wave pattern. These mix and interfere with each other, producing an undifferentiated jumble of noise. What we receive through our ears, however, are just two tiny streams of sound waves, each wave a single sum of all the waves striking the ear. From this minuscule sample of information, our brains somehow create a three-dimensional image of the world around us, separating the dangerous from the benign, the meaningful from the merely chaotic. Hi, my friend. The results are magic indeed. Even when we're dealing with something as mundane as everyday speech, our brains are, are working you? constantly are to you? make sense okay. of what our ears serve up. Speech is a fabulous medium for uh, conveying information via language, but the ear is something of a bottleneck. 
um, ultimately it really is a vibration. It's, it's air pressure varying over time. Now our uh, vocal tract packs a lot of information into that sound wave and our brain then unpacks it. So for example, we separately hear the content of speech, the vowels and the consonants from the overall melody and rhythm, which, and we can process the vowels and consonants in terms of the literal meaning and the melody and rhythm in terms of, say, the speaker's uh, emotional state. But before we can do any of this, we have to make sense out of the coos, clicks and grunts we call speech. We adults hear speech as a string of units, as sentences chopped up into words, as words chopped up into vowels and consonants. But that's something of an illusion, because if you were to look at a speech waveform on an oscilloscope, you wouldn't see silences between the words the way there are uh, little white spaces between words on a printed page, nor would you see regions in which one uh, consonant ends and the following vowel begins. <laughs> It's also why a foreign language will sound like a continuous ribbon of, of, uh, of noise to a foreign speaker. Unless you know the words, you don't know where one word leaves off and the other one begins. Our own language is every bit as much of a continuous ribbon of sound as a foreign language, but knowing the words, we have the illusion of uh, speech being a string of discrete units. Definitely the quality in again. Gina's brain that allows it to adapt itself to the information coming through her implants is called plasticity. And in mammals, plasticity is the special gift and talent of the very young. Without any explicit teaching, uh, children in the third and fourth years of their life acquire language and grammar and are absolute geniuses at doing so. I mean, their vocabulary may increase by 30 words a day and um, it's uh, that power um, uh, seems to occur at a very critical age. There's this extraordinary window in the third and fourth, fifth year to some extent, and then it starts to close. They don't usually come out in the middle. It is to take advantage of this window of brain plasticity that Blake Papson favors implanting children at the earliest possible opportunity. We know that the most primitive device, if placed in a very young child, will have an improved performance compared to the most sophisticated device put it in an older person. Because so much of the perception of sound has to do with plasticity and development. The earlier you get in a cochlear implant, the better the result, every time. Overwhelming, it was really overwhelming, terrifying at first. It was like I was put on a new planet and I didn't understand the language and I didn't understand anything that was going on. I had no frame of reference. Round and round, round and round. We can see the results of acquiring what? hearing at different ages round. in the Samson family. What? All have received implants, round. but at widely varying ages. One-year-old Eliana received implants in both ears at nine months. She already knows that reversing your vehicle requires a backup signal. Both her parents were raised using hearing aids and lip reading to offset their hearing impairment. Jonathan received his implant as an adult 10 years ago, and Tanya followed three years later. I was lost at first because I just found my head turning in all directions because there were so many sounds coming from all different places. Like when I went to the bathroom, it sounded like the Niagara Falls. I mean, I never heard the toilet flashed so loudly. And also, when I was taking the pasta and pans out from the drawer to do some cooking, I never realised how much noise it made. So actually, it was quite embarrassing when I started hearing everything because I never realised how loud I was all these years. Does he know all the words on this, uh, yeah. the pictures? OK, Jacob. Five-year-old Jacob received his first implant at eight months and his second at four years. OK, what's your name? Jacob. Mm -hmm. How old are you? Five and two quarters. Oh, wow. You're such five a big... Five and quarters. Five and five quarters. And when's your birthday? April 13th. 
Are you gonna have a? Did you have a birthday party? I had a birthday party. Already. What else did you do? Go swimming. Go swimming. Where did you go? As predicted, the plasticity of his young brain has given Jacob normal speech and comprehension, despite the very few frequencies he's hearing. Jacob, you have in laws. But what about wow. that other uniquely um, human gift? Jacob. Music. We still don't appreciate music partly because of our background, that we never really grew up with it, and partly because, you know, it, it gets a little late uh, for us. You know, I mean, I try to listen to music. It sounds nice, but when I sit down and put on something, you know, as some, as some other people might do, no. Jacob and Alian, on the other hand, uh, Jacob in particular, loves music. We, we've exposed him to it. You know, he thoroughly enjoys it and, can, and cannot get enough of it. With Ileana implanted bilaterally at nine months, there is hope for even better results. This is no small thing, as we're about to see, an experience of music in the early years of childhood can be enough to last a lifetime. That's right. This is where we tell you that Evelyn Glennie, the percussionist you saw earlier in this program, is profoundly deaf and has been for her whole adult life. So attached was she to sound and especially to music, that, deaf or not, she refused to give up her sense of hearing. I started losing my hearing when I was about eight years old. And then by the time I was 12 years old, I was totally reliant on hearing aids. And I think it was more frightening and daunting for my parents to sort of think beyond this deaf tag, as it were, as it were. I mean, suddenly their daughter was, she had a tag on her, you know, she was categorized and, oh, well, she is deaf, but what does that actually mean? You know, when you wake up, are you deaf? When you're tired, are you deaf? When you're fully focused, are you deaf? You know, what is happening to the body and what are you allowing the body to respond to? Her ease with spoken language and her musical understanding reflect the years of childhood hearing and music lessons. Today, she relies entirely on lip reading for conversation and has rejected hearing aids completely. I don't wear hearing aids. I stopped wearing hearing aids when I was about 20 years old. And really mainly because I found that I was actually hearing more by hearing less through the ears. So when you wear hearing aids... There's an awful lot of, of noises there that, you, that are very confusing, that are very distracting, that, that are very unhelpful. And I found that actually by hearing less through the ear and opening the body up, I was hearing a lot more. And then I'd simply just sit somewhere and observe and basically pay attention. And I would notice a car. Where did I feel that? Or people speaking. Where did I feel that? You would see something. Would you imagine sound with that? And really, I'd begin to link my senses up with basically what I'm seeing, and the eye is obviously very important for me. But it's her sense of touch that guides Glennie's musical hearing. got involved with percussion, then suddenly my whole sound world 
opened up completely and that was when I really began to understand that there was another route for me to deal with sound. The reason why I take my shoes off is because I need to be completely grounded and to feel this sound. I don't want part of my body being cut off. The body in itself is an instrument and you need to be able to manipulate that. The only part of me that is feeling that is literally somewhere around here. And the reason for that is because I have poor posture here. I'm sitting down, I'm wearing my shoes so my feet are not connected to the ground and I didn't open my hand up at all, nothing. So if I want to feel more of that, I would want to stand up. I'd want to take my shoes off I'd want to bend my knees and I'd want to be far more part of this, this instrument than I am. And I want to open my body up much more than I was when I was sitting down. So I will strike it again. And there, this time, I felt it right down the left hand side of my body from about maybe my chest downwards, right down. What I call gold sounds, things that resonate but are in the very high register, I could actually feel in the upper part of my body. So I could feel it on, on my cheekbones, my scalp, you know, my face and my neck, just the upper part. And, but what I couldn't do, I could recognise that things were happening, but I couldn't actually recognise and I cannot recognise the individual pitches at all. So if a glockenspiel is played, I can't say, oh, that's a C or that's a D flat. And, and it's just impossible. Those kind of sensations are not really, or I certainly can't decipher the actual pitch. Despite her disclaimer, Glenny clearly understands the principles of melody, and her music raises the bar for percussion players everywhere. To hear her talk, the truly disabled are those who use only their ears to do their hearing. For me, it wasn't all about coming through the ears. This was just such a tiny, tiny part of the body for me to register sound. And if I was only to allow that to happen, if I was only going to allow that sound to come through the ear, then I knew I'd be forever deaf, you know, whether scientifically I'd hearing or not. I would always be deaf if it was only going to come through the ears. Ironically, Glenny can ignore her ears precisely because, as a child, she had normal hearing at an age when her brain could build the solid speech and music centers that are the foundation for her career. Dr. Blake Papson, himself an accomplished musician, has built his career on giving hearing to those young enough to make the most of it. For him, too, the ultimate goal is a full experience of the human sense of hearing. It's only now, as we've looked at implanting younger and younger and younger children, sometimes bilaterally, that we are we starting to even get anywhere near the concept of normality with perception of music, perception of emotion, uh, ability to play musical instruments without frets like violins. Astounding. And it all has to do with the brain taking this primitive input to gain so much information from this primitive input, they can do the most human things with it. Nine days old. And the red that goes somewhere. Nine days old. The most human things. It's not merely having a sense of hearing that makes humans unique. It's what our marvelous brains, with the help of evolution, have done with it.
crowned with the prime in the springtime the only pretty ring time when birds do sing hey ding a ding ding sweet lovers love the spring Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>